Welcome to the CGIR Data Science Showcase. In this track, we will present CGIR scientists' innovative use of data science approaches. First, uh, as a quick background, who is a data scientist and what do they do? A data scientist is who writes code to create reproducible workflows for analyzing complex data with analytical methods, informed by domain knowledge. These highlighted keywords are very important. Uh, we are dealing with a large volume of complex data, so you need to be able to develop a computer program to analyze them. Using analytical methods, often machine learning approaches, your knowledge in food systems domain is also very important to understand the context and interpret the analysis results. So how does CGIR use these machine learning approaches? We recently ran an online survey to collect CGIR's machine learning use cases, where we asked to complete this sentence. What kind of analytical method they use to analyze what kind of data for what purposes? First, here you can see there are a lot of different analytical methods being used, from random forest to regression, classification, and neural net. Our colleague said uh, they need to use this method to analyze large volumes of data from, for example, satellite remote sensing, household surveys, agronomic trials, and soil and weather data. What was really interesting from this survey was the diversity of applications. Altogether, we identified almost 100 use cases uh, from crop yield prediction, pest monitoring, and modeling farmers' behavior under climate change. This is a very encouraging sign that the data science approaches are being more widely used, and also our scientists are realizing the potential of big data. But it's probably still not enough. Uh, this is a very rapidly changing area. To keep up with all the new techniques and data and tools, we will need to continue to support our scientists to explore new approaches and develop more exciting pilot use cases. One of the new areas we explored this year was the use of open data science competition platform. In partnership with Zindi and Amazon Web Services, we launched two machine learning challenges. One for identifying crop disease from pictures, and the second one on the identification of crop phenology from smartphone pictures. Please join me to congratulate our challenge winners. Your winning solutions will be used by our scientists to accelerate our research impact. The third challenge will launch soon, so stay tuned. Another new pilot program we are launching today is the CGIR Data Science Academy. In partnership with Coursera, we will enroll 25 CGIR scientists who are nominated by their peers to join Coursera's Data Science Academy program. We will support them to be trained and officially certified by one of the best data science training program in the world. Please also congratulate your, this cohort of 25 trainees. <laughs> and finally, today, we will have a chance to learn more about some of their data science work in CGIR. In this session, we will first showcase five presentations uh, from the Alliance of Biodiversity and CIAD on the plant breeding trial data analysis and the monitoring of rice phenology using satellite data, followed by CIMIT work on the mining of historical wheat data and modeling, and then ECRAFT work to empower local government for planning the low carbon development in Indonesia, and finally ECRISAT work on the use of big data to monitor rice production in India. So if you're ready, let's get started. Hi everyone, my name is Johanna Parisio. I am a research assistant for the alliance between Biodiversity and CIET. And today I want to share with you Mr. Beam. Mr. Bean is an easy to use R Chinese package that simplifies the analysis of large scale plant breeding experimental trials by using the power and versatility of linear mixed models. So there are a lot of packages that Mr. Bean uses, but for feeding linear mixed models, we have 
The first one, that is SPATS, the spatial analysis using splines, that is uh, a methodology proposed by Mera Soxe. The second one is uh, ASRMLR, that is distributed by BSN International. This is a licensed package. And the last one is LME4, that is also for feeding linear mixed models. And now, what Mr. Bean looks like. So, this is basically the home page for Mr. Bean. So if you want to give it a try, you can use your cell phone or your computer by following the next link. But what can Mr. Bean do for you? First of all, this allows you to import data. So it doesn't matter the file type that you have. And also, this allows you to connect with breeding management system. So if you have data there, you can get the data from directly from Mr. Bean. And then once you have the data, then you can jump to descriptive analysis. Then you can fit uh, the spatial analysis by using, for example, the first approach that is using SPATS. And if you have more than only one site, one single experiment, then you can run multiple sites using this approach. And also if you have more than only one trade, you can also run a multiple trades. So in this case, it's one by one then you can jump, for example, to the another approach that is using ASRML. In this case, it's incorporating autoregressive correlation. And then for ASRML, so we have a model selector. It's a little bit complicated to fit the best model by yourself. So you can use the, the model selector. And then for multiple environmental trial analysis, we have a two-stage approach. In this case, we use ASRML for feeding these uh, models. And the last one is related with traditional designs. In this case, we use LME4, and it's very useful for analyzing RCVD, CRD designs, alpha rally design. For modeling multi environmental trials, we have a two stage approach, which means that in the first stage, we have to analyze every single site separately, and then we have to save the means or the predicted values and also their standard errors. Then, uh, finally, the second stage is weighted by the inverse of the variances of predicted values from the first stage. It's important to mention that Mr. Bean allowed us to model different variance covariance structures for modeling the G by E, the genotype by environmental pattern. Uh, in that sense, uh, we can find identity matrix, uh, the core age matrix, diagonal matrix, unstructured matrix, and also factor analytic structures. You can find factor analytic number one, factor analytic number two, and factor analytic number four. So this allowed us to model the genotype by environmental pattern. So in this case, we can have like a different genotypic variant for each single site and also a covariance between each pair of sites. This would be the visualization when you feed a factor analytic structure to. In this case, you can find uh, the genotypic variant for each single site, the percentage of variance explain it. And this can reveal not only which genotype are best overall or in subsets of environments, but also can reveal the relationship among environments in terms of the G by E. If you want to know more about Mr. Bean and see uh, the capabilities of Mr. Bean, you can visit like, the demo on Shiny Apps Aya, and also you can visit our webpage that is Mr. Packages, and there you can uh, download the app if you want. And also we have the GitHub. This is our repository, Mr. Bean app. And then uh, you can install the app uh, by using like this uh, commands. So thank you so much for being here and see you later. Hi everybody, many thanks for inviting me to this wonderful event. I am here aimed at showing you the work that we have been doing during the last years using satellite data for agricultural purposes. 
My name is Andres Aguilar. I am a researcher at the Alliance Biodiversity CIAT. Specifically, I am part of the Digital Inclusion Lever. And my presentation is called RISE Phenology Monitoring Using Satellite-Based Data. This project was supported by the Colombian National Federation of Rice Growers and the University of Manchester. One of the goals of our team is to provide site-specific recommendations to farmers through data captured from their crop events, such as climate, soil, and management practices. In this sense, we have offered tools that help farmers during their decision-making process in activities like sowing date, fertilizer amount, cultivar to use, among others. However, on many occasions the information is delivered in an incomplete way, lacking useful data that could be helpful to understand the context in which the crop is planted. This is mainly due to the higher cost that could be implied in capturing this type of data. For that reason, it is necessary to involve methods that allow capturing of relevant information in a reliable way and in a cost-efficient manner. In this sense, satellite images have been used to provide crop development insights in a free open way and at a high spatial and temporal resolution. Although we can see satellite data as a good solution, first we need to consider the context in which the crop is planted, because their measurements can be inaccurately interpreted. Here we can see different rice spectral profiles which were taken under several crop systems, such as fertilizer amount, different growth stages, using several rice varieties and for rice plants affected by diseases. In this way, we see that the spectral patterns in each case doesn't have any significant difference in each other. Thus, it is important to firstly understand and record the field condition and then use satellite data to correctly interpret the crop phenological condition. Therefore, our methodology is first based on gathering data that are captured in the field by technicians. This observational data is related to a specific topic of interest. For example, identifying rice crops or detecting rice growth stages. Secondly, we pass through downloading and processing satellite images, which are taken by missions such as Landsat and Sentinel. Finally, we build up spectral profiles and metrics that will be used in different analysis methodology, for example, classification or predictive models. I'm going to show you two study cases that implement this workflow. The first example is about rice growth stage identification for a Colombia region called Saldaña, which is in the central region of the country. After Ferros collected the data, we download and process satellite images for two years, 2015 and 2016. Thereafter, we use three machine learning approaches, which were random forest, support vector machine, and gradient boosting machine. To use them, we split the database up in three groups, one for training, one for validation, and finally one for testing. After completing the training and testing process, we found out that Gradient Boosting Machine had the best performance using F1 score as a reference. Once we reached some confidence with our model, we classified the whole region in order to know what the rice crop stages were during December 21 of 2015. From there, we were able to estimate that 2000 three hectares were in vegetative stage, 2,974 in reproductive stage, 585 in ripening, and finally 1,321 were recently harvested. This kind of information is useful for the National Federation to calculate the total production for a region. Besides, 
it allows to the technician to rapidly identify which areas should be affected by extreme climate events that are not favorable for any specific growth stage. For the second case, we use data that were collected for the northern area of the Department of Tolima, aimed at detecting inside the crop fields zones that were affected by any kind of stress during the reproductive stage. Thus, we select a certain number of fields planted with rice and then we find out which were the dates that those fields were in the reproductive stage using the methodology explained it previously. Using the spectral data drawn from the Sentinel-2 mission, we classify the pattern using k-means with intention to differentiate which areas were different from each other. Finally, we average the spectral information for each cluster and we compare them with the spectral profiles reference that were reported in literature for rice healthy and unhealthy. This information allows to inform the farmers about heterogeneous plant developments inside their crop fields during critical stages. Finally, this information must be communicated in a precise and friendly way. Thus, we are developing a visualization model that integrates satellite images to our capturing data platform called AEPS, Agricultura Specifica por City where the technicians and farmers can query data for a specific place and planting date. So they receive the NDVI historical data and can see how was the field during the crop development period. This is a way to provide additional data that support their decision-making process. This is possible because of the available data in Google Earth Engine. Likewise, thinking in an open way, we are also uploading our codes in GitHub. So in conclusion, we saw how important can be the satellite data for providing new tools in the decision-making process for the farmers. So the only important thing is that you need to have ground data in order to achieve your goals. So that was all. Thank you for your attention and don't hesitate to write me if you have any question. Bye bye. Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone tuning in. Thank you so much to the organizers for the opportunity to present today. My name is Margaret Krauss and I'm a postdoc with the Global Wheat Program at CIMIT in Mexico, and I'm also presenting today in collaboration with Azam Lashkari, who's another postdoc at CIMIT. And today I'll be talking about a project that the two of us are working on as part of a larger team of people within CIMIT to begin using some of CIMIT's really extensive historical wheat data to plan for future climate scenarios. So the project focuses around the International Wheat Improvement Network, or IWIN, which is coordinated by CIMIT. And it's a network of public and, pri and private sector collaborators uh, worldwide that will grow and test CIMIT's bread wheat and durum wheat varieties. The IWIN also includes partners in the National Agricultural Research Systems, or the NARS. And through this network, the partners are able to test new material coming out of CIMIT and choose what they'd like to continue to work with. And one of the main benefits to CIMIT is that the partners are requested to return the testing data back to CIMIT. So over the past four decades in which CIMIT has coordinated the IWIN, they've been able to amass millions of data points on yield and other agronomic traits from nurseries at locations in over 90 countries. So this is a really remarkable data set from a research perspective. It's probably one of the most extensive multi-environment trials of any crop in the public sector, and it opens up a lot of opportunities to leverage the data to answer relevant research questions. The IWIN distributes a number of different types of nurseries, and I've listed just a few of them here. Perhaps one of the most well-known is the Elite Spring Wheat Yield Trial, or the SWIT, which contains high yield potential spring wheat uh, germplasm adapted to mega environment one. Um, this is one of the most 
one of the longest running eyewind nurseries. It was first established in 1981. And then in addition to Eswet, there are a number of different types of nurseries targeted at other mega environments, specific types of stress profiles, diseases, and then different types of breeding material as well. Within the IWIN, there are around 700 testing locations, each of which has been assigned to a different mega environment. And the mega environment dictates which types of nurseries uh, the location will receive. The, there is generally somewhat limited overlap from year to year in terms of the germplasm tested because, because each year represents a new set of breeding material. However, within a year, the same set of germplasm is sown at a large number of locations. I want to briefly recognize some of the previous efforts that have been made to leverage primarily the phenotypic records from the IWIN. These projects have aimed to use the IWIN data to understand how wheat yields are responding to climate factors and then also to assess genetic gains within the breeding program. But beyond these studies, actually not much of the IWIN data has been explored at a really high level. Um, CIMIT has been accumulating these really extensive phenotypic records, but to begin to understand the phenotypic variation within these data sets, we also need to know something about the genotypes and the environments in which uh, the testing occurred. And up till now, we haven't really had um, extensive data on those things. So now we have the capacity to genotype the IWIN accessions at a really high level. Some of the nurseries have already been genotyped with GBS, but then we're also working to impute nursery accessions based on resequencing of some of the CIMIT uh, bread wheat founder lines. And then in addition, many of the testing locations historically didn't have weather station infrastructure. So characterizing the environmental conditions at each site wasn't always possible. However, now with reconstructed weather data um, from the ERA-5 reanalysis data set from the European Center from, for Medium Range Weather Forecasts, we have access to um, global hourly estimates of atmospheric variables on a 30 kilometer grid dating back to 1979, but they also plan to release data back to 1950 as well. So now we can begin to couple the phenotypic records with really high quality genomic data and climate information. The way that the phenotypic data is collected is such that the collaborators are provided with this trial notes form to fill in information about planting dates, management, etc. And then they also receive this field book file which contains the names of the genotypes and includes space to record the agronomic traits. These records are currently available for several IWIN nurseries online at, with the International Wheat Information System or IWIS. And then many of them also appear on CIMIT's Dataverse. We're working as a group currently to curate a high quality data set of some of the nurseries. We actually started working on this about a year ago and have spent the better part of that year working on many challenges related to verifying that the data is correct, identifying and removing outliers, and then finally linking all the phenotypic information with weather and uh, genotypic information as well. So that's kind of where we are as a group, but we really look forward to releasing a curated data set with, of some of the nurseries with the genomic and weather data included for the community to use. Finally, what does our group intend to do with all of this data? Naturally, there could be lots of different applications, but for our group, we sort of have two main goals. First is to understand genotype by environment interaction at a greater level. An example of this would be that heading date is one of the most widely recorded traits in the IWIN. So we plan to leverage the data to conduct a very large evaluation of the effects of the flowering time genes in wheat on yield. And then we also have a number of objectives around planning for future climate scenarios. For example, we hope to use the data to identify critical heat and drought thresholds at specific growth stages. Um, which would provide insight into how wheat germplasm must be adapted to future climate analogs. And then finally, given the considerable volume of data and metadata in the IWIN nurseries, um, we expect to test a number of emerging analytics approaches. We're working closely with Jose Crosa of the biometrics unit to begin to link the genomic, environmental, and phenotypic information at this really extensive scale. So in summary, there are a lot of opportunities to leverage this data to answer uh, exciting and relevant research questions, and we hope that that should inform variety development and distribution as well. 
In addition to Azam and myself, there are a number of folks within CIMIT working on this project. Natasha Liggett is a consultant working with the Global Wheat Program. Um, Wei Xiong and Urs Schultes are both at the CIMIT office on the campus of Honan Agricultural University in Zhengzhou, China. Um, Jose Crosa of the Biometrics Unit at CIMIT has been working, on with, working with us on a lot of the analysis. And then Matthew Reynolds of the Global Wheat Program is coordinating a lot of these activities. Diego Pequeño is working on crop modeling aspects of the project, and Tom Payne has helped us uh, sort of track down a lot of the data and verify it. Of course, all of the material comes out of the CRP wheat programs, Kareem and Ravi Singh's programs, and then Leo Crespo Herrera and Philemon Juliana of the breeding programs have also worked with this data as well. And of course, none of this would be possible without the amazing commitment of the IWIN public and private collaborators from more than 90 countries that have been collecting this data over the past 40 years. So thank you so much, and I would like to direct questions to Matthew Reynolds of the Global Wheat Program. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Alfa Nugraha from ICRAF Indonesia. I will present our works on the empowering local governments for low carbon development planning in Indonesia. As one of the objectives of low carbon development planning in the economic structure of a region, especially at the provincial scale, it can be related to changes in environmental conditions, namely greenhouse gas emissions, using the basic framework of the extended input-output table with environmental aspects. The EIO model can evaluate the relationship between economic activities and environmental impacts such as how an economic sector produces pollution or emission compared to its output. EIO is widely used to evaluate upstream economic sectors, environmental impacts due to consumption, and environmental impacts in the form of goods and services. The government of Indonesia uses this approach to allow the interaction between the IO model and the environmental factors, consisting agriculture, forestry, energy consumption, and waste production. The interaction is called emission intensity as the main indicator of LCD plan, which put the emission reduction under direct comparison with the change of GDP. Under LCD plan, the policy scenarios will be simulated in the projection model, and the future emission intensity is expected can be reduced. Our key findings are, of course, redclue.id as the implementation of EEI, EEIO approach, and it's been considered as a national uh, planning tools. Redclue.id is developed using R with shiny package that provides a powerful web framework for building web applications using R. Linsol's package is also used to generate the scenario combination the most important part is the big data from a regional economic and satellite account of 34 provinces in Indonesia. This is our uh, simple uh, demo from our uh, application. The capacity strengthening and the evaluation process has been conducted internally in 12 sessions within the Ministry of Development Planning or Babanas in cross-ministerial processes. Redclue.id has comprehensively been disseminated with 34 provinces in Indonesia during a series of regional planning workshops. The feedback from hundreds of local governments in all provinces has also been provided to, to improve the tool. Regional Economic and Satellite Account Database for 34 provinces is well constructed and managed, and also the guideline and protocol for constructing the scenario of mitigation action into low carbon development scenario is drafted. The web application can be accessed through those links, uh, redclue.id, and also the code are also available at GitHub. Thank you very much. Hello everyone. The title of our topic is use of open data sources and big data platforms for dynamic crop monitoring of rice crop in Samastipur district of Bihar state in India. Uh, along with me, um, 
Dr. Pranuti from ICRISAT and Mayank from Dr. Reddy's Foundation. A little bit of a background of why we undertook this project and how it was funded by the Reddy's Foundation. The Dr. Reddy's Foundation were implementing a development project in Samastipur district of Bihar state where they were introducing uh, novel uh, rice varieties as result demonstration in farmer fields. And the idea here is to see whether remote sensing tools can be used and open data sources along with machine learning and artificial intelligence to see the performance of the crop and monitor it during the crop production time, that is during the growth stages. So this uh, experiment was undertaken very recently in the Karif season 2020, that is it started in June 2020. So the hypothesis was whether, whether big data along with uh, machine learning and AI can discriminate between the treatments, which are the varieties that were introduced from the controls, which were the farmer practices in these field demonstration program. So what did we use? Uh, we mostly used uh, Sentinel-1, having 30 meters of resolution, Sentinel-2, uh, 10 meter to 20 meter resolution day, and Landsat. And the open platform that we used was Google Earth Engine. Uh, where is the project located? It is in Bihar state. And we were very specifically looking at uh, Samastipur district. We had 122 um, plots. Out of them, half of them were uh, 21 of these rice varieties that were introduced in farmer field. And the controls were the local uh, variety that the farmers were using in those corresponding uh, plots uh, where the treatments were taken. So the time, where some of the sowing times were around June 1st to 20th of July. So we realized that uh, data that was gathered to, through the Sentinel and uh, uh, Landsat was used for uh, looking at the time series of spectral images and uh, backscatter that was on vegetation. So which were developed using uh, JavaScript API in Google Earth Engine and a comparative analysis to see if the significant differences between the treatments and the control using ANOVA. Now I hand over to my colleague, Dr. Pranuti. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Srikant. Good day, everyone. Here I give you insights about the project approach and some preliminary results as the project is still under nascent stage. In, in, in this project, we have uh, accessed open source satellite data from Google Cloud using Google Earth Engine and develop time series of vegetation indices using some APIs. Using these indices, we have done a comparative analysis between treatment and control plots. And, uh, here, uh, we, you can see the trend uh, trends and uh, we have done an ANOVA analysis on that. And the other objective is to develop AI models to predict crop parameters using these indices as proxies. So the spectral and the backscatter uh, back uh, indices will be used as proxies. And the other objective is also to um, develop an interactive you know, Google Earth Engine based web app for visualization of images and time series data. And the, the, here uh, I present the results of Sentinel-2. We tried retrieving data from Sentinel-2, but we have only one cloud-free image acquired on 30th August. And using this image, we have developed five biophysical variables, which are leaf area index, uh, uh, chlorophyll content, vegetation cover, a crop water content and uh, photosynthetically active radiation. And here in this graphs, you can see the variation in the parameters for different varieties and between the treatment and the mm -hmm. control plots also. But uh, this could not be ascertained as uh, we don't have any ground truth data at this point of time and which can only be made available at the end of the season. And uh, coming to the next slide, we, uh, this is the time series of the VH, um, the Sentinel-1 data. And uh, Sentinel-1 is based on the backscatter of a microwave sensor, which captures backscatter at different polarization angles. The cloud cannot obstruct this backscatter, um, and it is uh, the clouds become transparent. From GE, we could only uh, using from uh, GE cloud, we could only get uh, VH, uh, VB and VH uh, polarized bands. And uh, using these bands, we have developed two more indices: VH by VB and VV by VH. And you can see them in the four graphs. In the third graphs you can see that VH by VV index was consistent with the rice crop phenology 
uh, that is grown in the Samastipur district. Mm -hmm. And so we use this index, VH5VV index to develop ANOVA. And we found out that uh, the uh, treatment, uh, there was a significant uh, difference between the treatment and the control in five different varieties, which are uh, highlighted in orange and green color. 644, Corteva, PH71, PHB71, Rajendra Bhagwati, and Sugandha. And for only Rajendra Bhagwati, you see VH by VB index is higher uh, in treatment and uh, it is lesser in case of control plot. The other slide is uh, the here we have developed uh, a web app. In the, uh, it is in halfway. Here on the left hand side, you can see um, the there are 24 images in this here uh, and uh, from, starting from June to the September uh, uh, end of the September and which can be viewed uh, with a time lapse of uh, uh, two uh, th uh, three uh, th three seconds and um, and in the right hand side you can see uh, a drop down uh, of the plots and uh, you can uh, on the the plot time uh, on the plot uh, you when you click on the plot you develop a time series of vegetation indices for that particular plot. And uh, here we intend to use AI model that is recurrent neural network, which is particularly for time series. Here you, we are planning to use the, the indices as the dependent variables, and we develop uh, uh, a, a model which can predict uh, the crop parameters at different stages because it has a back propagation. It can different, uh, it can uh, uh, predict at different ti uh, times. And uh, the preliminary results we present here are that uh, the biophysical variables were higher for the treatment con treatment plots in comparison with the control. And VH by VEV index was consistent with the crop phenology of the rice varieties. And uh, for direct, uh, the trend of VH by VEV was uh, different for direct seeded and transplanted varieties. And VH by VEV index between uh, was uh, significant uh, for uh, you know, five varieties out of 21 varieties. And uh, during this period, we encountered some challenges, which are uh, the COVID-19 was the biggest challenge for co collection of the co uh, geo coordinates and also to validate them. And uh, mobile GPS had some inaccuracies and uh, there uh, no data was available due to the presence of cloud. Uh, spectral data was not available. And uh, probably in the coming seasons and the coming days, we could present much more better results. And uh, for this, um, this uh, with this results, I end my presentation. Thank you so much.